Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a Morris Federation online event. Uh, my name is Pauline Moose Wilson. I'm current president of the Morris Federation, and today we have Andrew Kennedy talking to us about winter sword dancing. Over to you, Andrew. Okay, thank you, Pauline. Um, well, this talk builds on one I gave for the Fed. I don't know, was it eighteen months ago, something like that, and it's the way actually giving the talk sets you thinking again and uh, um, gets new ideas coming through. Um, so that there'll be a key quotation which uh, sparked my interest, which we will come to in due course. Um, I'm talking really about, um, well, last time I did a talk, it was about who were the dancers and what did they think they were doing? And I had this contention that, that all of this is very provisional. I would never make this as a sort of well, a black and white issue, actually. Um, I, I wouldn't be hard, hard line about any of this. But my feeling is that there are the winter sword dancing something, blah, blah, winter sword dancing is something quite different from the, the big displays you see in the summer. And that originally. It was in some ways peripheral. The purpose of the thing was not to go sword dancing. The purpose was something else. And a part of that was that people went sword dancing. So that was sort of my contention in my last talk. And I've, I'm coming on here to some of the characteristics, not simply of winter sword dancing, but how that fits into winter festivities generally. And then of course, I've got people from uh, Sheffield here who've been winter sword dancing today. And um, they might well agree, uh, disagree utterly with me, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so there's some pictures which got me thinking. Now that this quotation here is one that I finished my last talk with, um, because it struck me as a key to understanding um, a lot of what goes on. Um, and if we look back at the records, and I have to say, I've been working largely on records from Germany and um, the Netherlands rather than British records, although I have some familiarity with the British stuff as well. Um, and it's clear that the core of sword dancing was young men, apprentices and journeymen. And um, this quotation sort of sums it up for me. This is the young men and going out, having a good time and leaving the women doing the household graft at home. And this, this theme just comes up time and again. And then, you know, we've had a lot of protests over the last couple of years. And I was interested, I've got some photographs of different protests here. Can, can, should we be screen sharing? Oh, that's a good idea, isn't it? Um, yeah, of course. Right, let's do that. Hang on, where is it? That one can share. Now then, how's that? Can we see it yet? Yep, good. So you haven't missed anything. So there's my quotation. Um, while, the, while all the mothers and the sisters and the babies sit and rot at home. Um, and that, that was the attitude, I think, of a lot of sword dancers over the ages. Um, and of course, in Britain, it's very much changed now. Um, on the continent, not so much so. Um, and it's interesting, it took me back about 40 years, um, 30 or 40 years to my, my first Saddleworth rush cart, when I was walking up the road, pulling the cart, and in those days, all the Saddleworth wives and partners um, were walking along at the side, pushing push chairs, carrying their bags for them, carrying their instruments and all that sort of thing. Um, and Saddleworth has uh, changed dramatically now. And then I went to um, a sword festival last summer and a, a vast Italian team turned up. Um, and the women have all got the babies and the push chairs and they're carrying the bags while the men go along dancing. Um, so it might have changed in Britain, it hasn't changed on the continent. The top left uh, image is um, an Extinction Rebellion one. 
And when you look at it, you see color, you see um, men and women together, uh, you see different generations, um, you see a mass event, um, an inclusive event. And then bottom left, um, insulate Britain. Again, we've got color. Um, we've got people cheerfully sitting in the road. Um, they're not breaking windows or anything. They're sitting in the road. Um, can't actually see if anyone's actually glued themselves to it, but it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, and again, men and women, they look, they look mostly older, but you, know, you do get mixed ages in, in Chile, Britain. Now let's look at the, the, the ones on the right. The one in the middle at the top is um, a group of hunt saboteurs who are not exclusively male. You tend to find hunt, an awful lot of hunt saboteurs um, are young men. And then on the right hand side, we have, uh, I think that's from America, Antifa, the anti-fascist organization. And what we see in both cases is the male, it, it's the use of black, um, the masking. And these are men who are out for a bit of a rowdy time. And also it is fun, you know, uh, people on the receiving end might not see it as fun, but it's young men going out being hooligans and having a laugh an awful lot of it. And they will say, you know, the, the, the principles behind what they do are tremendously important. But in fact, if you follow some of the people who do it, you'll find they move from group to group. Um, and um, sadly, I would identify winter sword dancing with the ones on the right there, and um, modern English sword dancing with the ones on the left. Um, I'll, I'll go on and explain that a little bit, and then you can all shout me down at the end. Um, if I can move the screen up. Okay. So I'm thinking in particular about the use of disguise here. And in European culture, yeah, use of disguise goes back as far as you want to take it. But an interesting story is that of the Venice Carnival, which goes back to the 13th century or so, which is about as far back as we can, well, a little bit earlier than we can take sword dancing, actually. Um, it's a winter season, in the case of the Venice Carnival, from the 26th of December until Shrove Tuesday. And masks are used very specifically for disguise, to conceal the identity of the wearer, originally. And there are reasons for this. The Venice, Venice Carnival, or Carnival generally, was associated with riotous behaviour, um, sexual adventure, so um, you can carry on because nobody quite knows who's carrying on. Um, obscuring class differences was a really important feature because um, in Venice, there were, and much, much of Europe, very strict rules linking the clothing you wore to your social status. And um, it was partly to discourage excess. It was also to stop people getting above themselves. You put on a carnival costume, nobody knows who you are. I'm going to come back to that. Um, and what we find is that masks were banned in Venice in the 18th century. Um, and we actually find quite a lot of bands going across Europe, not just, not just in, in Venice. And when they reappeared later in the 19th century, they become stylized. We look at the couple on the right in that picture. And they are masked, but they're not really concealing their identity. The mask has become a fashion accessory. It, it's mutated. Um, so, um, you know, these changes are taking place all the time. Um, also, now, I, I've been selective with these pictures. Um, notice the, the wearing of black here. And the black is quite common for reasons I'm going to come and explain. It doesn't mean that black is the only colour that is worn or that midwinter festivities involve wearing simply black and nothing else. That doesn't mean anything like that. But black is a very common theme in the clothing as well as in the masks. So some propositions for you that I've been thinking about. Um, something based on what I said in my last talk, I would argue that we can't define sword dancing, but we know it when we see it. And I say that in as much as any um, criterion you come up, come up with for um, trying to describe what sword dancing is, 
you'll find a group of sword dancers who don't conform to it. Um, but nevertheless, we know it when we see it, more or less. And as I've said, historically, it was young men, apprentices and journeymen in particular, and then it moved to young men like farm laborers as well. It moved from the towns into the countryside. Um, and also um, we see the sons of the middle class, people who, whose families wouldn't really be sword dancers, expect to be for sword dancers, but the sons of the middle class, so-called slumming it, going, um, going out and mixing with the sword dancers, if you like, um, for a little bit of uh, youthful transgression before they go on to respectable, um, professional lives later on. And then this is my argument really that I would contend there are different uses, different contexts for sword dancing. And there's sword dancing as an event in itself, um, particularly for civic or religious occasions. I'll be giving some examples of that. And then there's sword dancing as simply a part of midwinter festivities. And the thing is, it's possibly hard for us to see that now, in that we, um, many of us belong to groups who meet on a regular basis, and we practice, and we identify opportunities to go out and do sword dancing. It really wasn't how it worked in the past. Um, you didn't join a sword dance team. Um, you joined something else, and a part of what they did was sword dancing. Um, and Midwinter sword dancing has been absorbed into broader festive tradition of midwinter activities. And it's char characterized, I'm arguing here, by the use of black in costumes and by the use of masks and other disguise. Now, um, one of the things we can't avoid talking about here uh, is as an alternative to masking, for reasons I'll explain, um, would be, blacking up your face but I'm really putting this in the historical context and I'm not terribly interested in entering into current debates which I think have been exhausted really and um, that's gone as far as it's going. So some common features well first of all the midwinter season was variable um, and I'll be giving some examples of this here we've already looked at Venice which started on the 26th of December Quite often around about All Souls Day, which is the 1st of November, or Martin Mass, the 11th of November, um, that sort of time running through to Shrove Tuesday, that's a definite end to it, um, with the season of Lent beginning and all the festivities coming to a halt. There was a midwinter mid emphasis on Christmas and New Year and Shrove Tide. Um, and characteristics, noise and disorder, um, so not simply um, going out and dancing, but um, making a racket, banging pans, pots and pans together, that kind of thing. And um, drinking and sex, these are all part of it. Um, and as I say, for every generalization, there are going to be exceptions. So this business about black and white then, where, where did I get it? What crystallized it in my mind? I, I was looking um, at a book on sword dancing uh, by uh, a German called Meschke. And he talks about a verse chronicle from the year 1480. And it describes a courtly dance, so it's an upper class event, a, a courtly dance of 1474. Um, and he talks about how the men and women, both men and women, wore white smocks um, for this courtly event. Um, and of course, in those days, maintaining white clothing was in itself not easy. And it was a, you know, a sign of status. And for the final part of the third dance, um, they, they, they went away and they reappeared with their faces blackened with soot. And um, Meshka argues that white was seen as the formal or courtly color and black was seen as the color of masquerade and fun. This is the um, title I gave to um, an article I did for Rattle Up My Boys. Um, so black is the, uh, the color of masquerade and fun. Um, so if we look 
at the dancing that was going on at the time of that courtly dance, we see that sword dancing appears to have started in the towns. Um, so it's linked to urban development in Germany in particular, but also the Netherlands and elsewhere, but it's very much an urban pursuit. And it was performed by originally the crafts and the guilds, such as the couplers in Nuremberg, 1350. Um, they were also couplers in Brunswick, but also there, there were other guilds involved, shoemakers and skinners and what have you. And in Nuremberg, the usual time was Shrove Tuesday. Now, the thing is, this dance was a big formal event. Excuse me. <coughs> um, they were dancing for the mayor. They would put the dance on if the city had royal visitors, um, whether the princely or from the empire or wherever. Um, so it was a big civic event. And these dances could be large. Um, when we think about you know, the typical English sword dance for six, nowadays sometimes five dancers, or in some cases eight. Um, but we're talking about, um, for example, in Breslau in 1620, 36 dancers. Um, now, this limits to some extent the complexity of the dance. Um, and you'd, you'd find two things going on largely. One was dancing as a sort of snake and um, going over under the swords in a long line. And the other might be to make a ring. And the key um, dance figures that we know of um, include the bridge, um, which if you know Papastur, it'd be a drop sword tunnel, two, two rows of dancers facing each other. Um, and uh, to do that, you would not be linked. And the other one is the figure they call the rose, which um, is a kind of sword lock, uh, but not necessarily the lock as we think of it. So these were simple dances, but big, and you know, it was about the occasion, the sense of occasion. And the first indication I've been able to find of a farmer's dance um, comes from 1551 in Ulm, South Germany. Um, this is the sort of, I can't remember the exact date of the, um, um, the famous picture uh, in, in Flanders. Um, but uh, the thing about the farmer's dance here was the role of the fool, which is going to play an important part in this argument. Um, so the fool, sometimes called the Nara, sometimes called the Hansler or Hanswurst, um, but the fool is very important to this. So this is a picture I showed last time in our last talk. Um, I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle now. This is um, a dance of the Nuremberg Cutler's Guild. This was uh, painted in 1600. And what interests me here is a couple of things. Um, firstly, the dancers, it's all quite stately, it's quite static. Um, they're moving around in this huge, huge line. Um, and then in the middle, you've got these two platforms of swords uh, supported by men with two men fighting on the top. But if you think about it, if you're standing on a platform of interlaced swords, firstly, it's not going to be very steady. Secondly, they're going to be places where your foot can go through. So I would suggest that this was more for display than an actual, um, you know, a choreographed display rather than a real combat. But the other thing is over on the left-hand side, you've got these finely, finely dressed gentlemen on horses. Um, and, you know, this is um, a big, formal, serious occasion. Civic, an example of the civic dance. And what we then have here then is the um, sword dance company from Überlingen in South Germany. The chap on the left is from Croatia, we won't worry about him for now. Um, but we see um, these are descendants of the town militia and um, their, their uniforms are colourful. We've got the, the white of the socks and the gloves and the shirt. Um, we've got the colours, coloured sashes, navy blue, not black coats. Um, very orderly, 
And the way this works is that um, they have to ask the mayor for permission to dance. And the mayor grants them permission to dance. They do their dance and in the summer, and um, then they get paid. The other side of it is that having granted them permission to dance, the mayor is then obliged to pay them in wine because um, it's a wine growing area. And one interesting thing about them is the fact that they've managed to keep their swords all the way through the tradition. Because what happened in the, um, the, the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th, a lot of um, the sword dancers were um, disarmed by Napoleon. For example, the, um, the Machelen in Tolleran in Belgium, um, their swords are now in a museum, or surviving swords are now in a museum. They were a, um, a guild who were there to defend the city. And when Napoleon marched in, he took their swords off them. They never got them back. And that was the end really of sword dancing in Belgium, Napoleon disarming the sword dancers. Um, it was a little bit different in South Germany because the um, King of Baden uh, sided with Napoleon. And so Napoleon never actually in, in, um, invaded them and he never disarmed them. So uh, they've managed to keep their swords and they're still nominally the town militia. And before they dance, they always go on parade like this. So that's, that's a very formal civic event in sword dancing. Let's see if we can move on. Here's the closest that we have to this kind of thing in Britain. I'm sorry about uh, the, the black and white picture on the left. Um, the uh, sword dancer's costume in Perth is currently um, off display and it's being restored. So what happened in Perth was that um, one of the guilds, the, the Glovers, um, in 1617, when the town visit was visited by uh, James VI of Scotland, James I of England, um, they put on their sword dance for him. And um, again, uh, typically in the continental tradition, you've got the guild, you've got the apprentices of the guild who do the dance, and they do it for a big civic occasion and a royal visit. And then in 1633, um, King Charles I visited Perth and the city authorities said um, it would be really good if the sword dance, if, if the glovers would do their sword dance again. So they did um, and the town agreed to pay them and it took years for the town, for the glovers actually to extract their payment from the town. But this is uh, a surviving costume. It's been through the wars a bit over the years because Occasionally it got brought out for processions and things and it got altered. But what we've got here is the um, scarlet and green cap with the tassels hanging from it. And hanging from the tassels are quite rare nuts. I, I forget the exact um, variety, but uh, they're poisonous nuts, which would have been very expensive, very, they were very rare. And I'm interested in the cap simply because you know, on the left, it's just been plonked on the dummy's head. Um, but I suspect they would have hung down in front of the eyes, just like the corks on an Australian's hat. And um, to me, that is almost the kind of disguise that's going on there. And then you've got the bell pads. Well, 21 bell pads survive, and they just laced them wherever they could on the dummy without any real thought from a dancer as to where bell pads might go. And then you've got um, the green top and the long white silk. Um, shift or whatever you want to call it, um, and then knitted silk, red silk stockings and white shoes with um, red piping. Um, and so this interests me because firstly it's the only example from Britain of one of these civic guild dances and it's very much more in the continental tradition than in as we've come to know sword dancing in England since then. But it also interests me because of this cap, um, a curious cap, which we don't see anywhere else. So they're currently um, restoring that. And in fact, Perth is to get, well, the museum and art gallery is being split and the museum elements going to another building, which is going to be opened in 2024. 
and they're hoping to have a recreation of the Perth Glover's swordlands there. And um, Jeff Lawson and I have managed to get ourselves involved in that, or actually we were approached. But uh, So that's all quite an interesting project and you'll hear more about that in due course. So that's the Perth costume, tied very much to this European tradition. Now here's a different image, also a well-known one. This is from Zurich, um, from a, um, a manuscript of, well, a collection from 1578. Um, and um, it's, this collection is called, um, sorry, the picture is from 1578. The, manu the collection is about um, the history of uh, Zurich, uh, 1560 to 87, a whole series of pictures. And there's this wonderful picture of a sword dance. Now, I'm just going to go back if, it, if I can manage it. We look at this, we see the very formal, the very stately um, flavour of the illustration. Um, and then we look at this, you know, it's, it's only, you know, um, 22 years before the other one, but this is a completely different image to me. This, there's a, you can see the drive of the dancers. Um, I think there's a, I think I've counted a dozen of them um, in a snake. Um, but look at the legs, look at the way they're leaning forward into the dance. This is a dance that's full of life um, and energy. And then when we look, yeah, we've got the musicians at the bottom right. Top left, we've got this curious character um, in the multicolored striped costume. I'm going to come back to that. Um, either makeup or mask. Um, bottom left, this grotesque figure, again, a striped costume. And the dancers themselves um, have this curious uh, turban-like thing with a couple of feathers in the front. Um, and of course, they've got black faces. And you can see that because just around the edge of some of them, you can see the pink flesh or the pink ears. So this to me is a completely different kind of dance from the one shown in uh, Nuremberg. And this dance to me looks like what we know about midwinter sword dancing. The black face, the disguise, um, the liveliness, and the fact that the audience are um, sort of in fool's costumes type of thing. We don't see the gentry here, we don't see royalty. It's a bit rowdy for them, it's a bit raucous. Um, and this is a different kind of performance. So, Yes, there have been some interesting things said about the masking in the dancing. Um, Teal, writing in 1970, there is a list at the end of this slideshow, by the way, of the sources I've used. Um, Teal associated masking with winter festivities generally, not with sword dancing particularly. Um, he identified the period as being between Advent, so that's the first Sunday in December, between Advent and Shrove Tuesday. Um, and he said that face blackening rather than masking. Face blackening was associated more with fools and characters that surround the dancing rather than with the dancers themselves. So that Zurich one uh, is more unusual in that respect. Louis, writing 1963, um, suggested that dancing with blackened faces was only a subset. You know, it wasn't the main thing that went on, um, but it was a subset worth considering. Um, and he is quite dismissive of the idea of linking it to the Moors or to mining. And he said this, these were retrospective explanations added by collectors and antiquarians. Um, and yes, you, you do read some, some awful stuff. Um, as soon as you start reading about um, it's likely that, or we think it's possible that, um, that's the time to walk away. And no doubt someone will catch me doing exactly the same thing. So what we've got here then, um, again from Uberling, and on the left is a, a Hansler. Um, this is actually a Hansler that um, goes out with the dancers. But I think, again, a couple of traditions have come together here. Um, you'll see the black mask um, with, with the long thing, a bit like an elephant's trunk. Um, it, it's all very strange. And the costume underneath, um, the coloured tatters, um, which, if we look across the, the one on the right, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, it's this Harlequin costume. 
And this idea of the, the so the colors are there, but there's a strong note of the black um, and the black mask. And the Hansler in Überlingen, that's a tradition in its own right. And um, during carnival, there's a day when the men of the town, well, men of the town, not all the men of the town, but many men of the town, go out wearing these costumes and with large whips, which uh, and it's, the trick is to crack the whip against the ground. And so there's one of these fools who goes out with a sword dancer and he clears the dancing space with the whip. Um, the interesting thing is, um, the tradition is that it's only the men who wear these costumes at Carnival, but who would actually know? And I've no doubt, there we go, there I'm doing it now. Um, there will have been women uh, doing that at some point. Um, who would ever know whether it was women or not? The theory is, um, it, it's a men's thing. And again, it's rowdy. Um, you start drinking about eight or nine in the morning and you carry on to the end of the day. And um, I don't know, I, I, can't, I can't see us the costume for picking up chicks, but uh, it seems to, be, uh, seems to be quite a successful ploy. The one on the right is interesting. Um, the Volkstanz Gruppe Frommen, um, it comes, it's not far from uh, Übling actually, southwest Germany. Um, and it's a folk dance group that dates um, from, I think, the 1960s. And uh, it was originally started as a youth group. And it's now got all sorts of things going on, not just sword dancing, but sword dancing is a part of it. But the sword dance that they perform is one that was reconstructed in the 1950s um, out of old um, uh, notations and, and so on. And um, this was put together um, really as, as an idea of keeping German sword dancing going. If you want to do some sword dancing, here's a dance which is reasonably traditional. And various groups have, have taken this dance up. Um, you see the fool here, once again, he's wearing this um, Harlequin costume. And instead of blackening or disguising his face, he's got this wooden mask. And it, what's fascinating about this performance is that the climax of the dance is when the dancers um, lace their swords around his neck. I wouldn't go so far as to say lock, but they lace their swords around his neck and they apparently lift him up into the air. And then they draw the swords and behead him, at which point the mask flies off. And it really, it's very effective. You know, we, we've all seen sword dance and beheadings, but this is a particularly effective one. But, but the mask comes into it. But the masks here, both, both people wearing masks here are uh, fools rather than dancers. And there are reasons for that. So if we come back closer to home, we look at um, Scottish folk play, you know, what, what the English would call mumming, the Scots tend to call galoshins. Um, arguably, but not certainly, from the shoes they wore. Like, you know, like, like the word galoshes. Anyway, the Scottish folk play, galoshes. Um, the season in Scotland was from All Hallows, 1st of November, to Candlemas, the 2nd of February. Because of course, in Presbyterian Scotland, um, a lot of the festivals such as you know, Carnival and Shrove Tuesday had been swept away. So All Hallows to Candlemas. White shirt, as we've, as we've seen elsewhere, but the, the way you make this um, a winter thing, the way you make it um, uh, more rowdy, if you like, is the coloured face quite often, probably mostly, blackened with soot. It was available everywhere. But sometimes blue, sometimes white, including using flour to, to disguise the face. There are records of... Um, the um, Scottish mummers using masks, but um, there were prohibitions. For example, in Aberdeen, they were specifically prohibited. And there was also a problem with disguising performers in that uh, they found that locals would only give money uh, to people they knew. So if it was a, a group of local performers, they'd give money to them. If it was incomers on tour, they wouldn't give money to them. And uh, disguising them too much made it difficult and made the audiences suspicious. So uh, they'd be less likely to give money if the performers are disguised. Mm -hmm. 
And then we come to the uh, Bamps and Weavers dance, um, which has been uh, revived in recent years or recreated, if you like. And this goes back to a poem uh, written by a chap called Mark Lonsdale in 1811, um, describing an event that happened around about 1780. And there was a party or upshot, as they called it, in a barn um, in Great Autumn. And it took place on what they called Fasten's Even, uh, which is Shrove Tuesday. And you can link that to the German Fasching or Fasner. So on Fasten's Evening, around about 1780, there's a party going on in a barn in Great Autumn. And suddenly there's a pistol shot, stopped everything dead. And in come the mummers and they're masked, and they're causing mayhem, you know, they run in, they're rowdy, they're running round, knocking things over, whatever. And it all settled down and they did a sword dance. And the five sword dancers are all named. Um, so we, we know there were five dancers, we know, we don't know much about it, about the dance, except um, that at one point the lot went wrong. Not the first time. Um, but a lot of the fun for the audience, unlike in Scotland where they're worrying about who they give money to, a lot of the fun here was trying to identify who the dancers were. Who were these people who'd come bursting in? And then suddenly, um, one of the masks fell off and people realised they were a bunch of weavers from nearby Bampton. Hence the Bampton Weavers dance. And it turns out this kind of... Um, Masking and then entry, like that, the rowdy entry, was not unusual. And there's a story from about this time of a family who are actually, actually robbed in their own home and didn't realise it to begin with, because when the robbers came in, masked and threatening them with guns, the family thought it was a bunch of mummers. Um, it was only when the robbers started uh, collecting their loot, um, the family realised what was going on. Um, so anyway, and from that, you, you can tell this was quite a, a lively event. Going back to Teal again, masks were only worn in Eastern Europe um, between Advent and Shrove Tuesday. That's that same season again. And they were particularly part of carnival fashion. And he said that blackened faces were for fools, but also for the attendance of straw bears, um, of which there were a number. And then if we go to Eger, which is nowadays in Hungary, um, the wild hunt was um, a man being pursued through the woods by youths with blackened or reddened faces. Um, so again, it's the young men, um, their blood is up, they're chasing through the woods, um, and it all, all goes together like this. Masks were also common, again, for fools and characters. Oh, sorry, masks were common for dancers, blackening was mainly for fools and characters. So I'm bombarding you with these things, but it just, it's just interesting how we see this pattern repeated time and again across Europe. So we come to Elgin um, and what I've described as midwinter riotousness, because Elgin's famous for the sword dance once again, and once again I would argue that the sword dance was almost peripheral, it was just one element in what was really going on. It, it wasn't about sword dancing. Um, and the Scottish, Scottish Presbyterian Church was trying to stop Yuletide celebrations. That was the first thing. Uh, in particular, they didn't like it when people sang or danced or did whatever outside the church while the minister was trying to preach. And apparently that went on quite a bit. Um, so 1598, December 1598, we've got a man called George Kay accused of dancing and guising on the 28th. And in particular, he, admitting, he admitted wearing his sister's coat, and this idea of cross-dressing is something we see quite a bit. Um, other, others with him were masked and with blackened faces, and there was a lad playing bones and bells. Um, so, yeah, they're having a, a, a bit of a party. Um, but this idea of disguise, cross-dressing, all that kind of thing is part of it. January 1600, Marion Anderson, so it's not just the men, Marion Anderson 
was punished for guising through the town in men's clothes. Um, that, in, that in itself was enough to get her into trouble and having to sit on the stool of repentance in the kirk. And then we come to um, the sword dance that, that many of us know about, but this is the point that the sword dance um, wasn't um, a one-off and it wasn't uh, a, an event in itself. Uh, we've got this tradition of the guising at Yuletide. And in fact, when you read the report about the sword dance in Elgin, the heading is geysers. So the people who prosecuted them and the people who um, recorded that prosecution, they're seeing these people as geysers, not as sword dancers. So five men were fined for dancing a sword dance in the churchyard on the 6th of January with masks and visors on their face. So this was a masked sword dance. Um, let's say they're seen as geysers, not primarily as dancers. And then that takes us on to one sort of uh, curious direction in sword dance, which is beard masks. Um, and they certainly flourished in the 15th century, um, in Nuremberg again, among other places. Um, but we can also go more recently to places like Gothland. Um, so in Brunswick in 1617, permission to dance was made conditional on no masking. So the authorities are starting to, to spot the significance of this. And, um, you know, there are the respectable dancers who uh, do it without masks, and there are the troublesome ones who do it with masks. And I've mentioned the ban on masks in Aberdeen in 1605, Elgin in 1598 and 1623. So, you know, the authorities are definitely onto this one. But we do see a survival of the beard mask. Wolfram uh, noted it in... Um, Slights, um, photographs from slights in uh, Sharp's uh, Sword Dances of Northern England, the second volume. But also, um, if you're very lucky, you can still see it in Gothland. And here's a picture from 1950 of the Gothland plough stocks. And if you look in the back row at these fools, you see the big false beards, um, but also a take on the Harlequin costume as well. It's more sort of rustic and you know just patchwork. It's this same idea, the long-standing idea of the fool in the Harlequin costume. And then over on our left here, we see, I don't know, he looks very meek, much like um, a mummer's doctor, with again the big mask. And then there's the chap here with the lovely curved stick. Is it a mask or is it his own beard? Who knows? Um, but um, so the dancers themselves are just dressed in the costume of that particular time. Um, but this, this collection of fools, I think that's absolutely lovely. And what we find um, in the Cleveland tradition is that sometimes the, the fools and characters who went around outnumbered the dancers and you get this great mass of people going around and again, the dancers were at the center of it, they did a performance, but there would also be the threat to um, plow up the lawn of people who didn't give suitable food and drink or money or whatever. Um, so there, there was this raucous element. These, these would have been, um, a lot of them would be farm workers who went out in midwinter when there wasn't much farm work going on. It's, it's a sort of holiday for them. Again, they left their wives behind they went around maybe for a week or 10 days at a time, sleeping in barns, that kind of thing, collecting food and drink and money, and just having a bit of a break from it all. Um, so that, that's the Gotham plough stocks. And I say, I'm told you, if you're very lucky, you will still see uh, an occasional beard mask. So where does that take us then? Um, well, sword dancing started in the towns and among the apprentices and journeymen. Now, it's quite possible that the, sword, the, the town's sword dances were slightly more restrained simply because the adults in the guild would have been keeping an eye on the young men. And um, so we have these respectable urban sort of civic sword dances, serious and orderly. They got taken up 
there's one element of midwinter celebrations. Um, you know, we're going to dress up, we're going to dance, why not do a sword dance while we're at it? Um, and these were sort of lively, more troublesome ones. This is where the masking came in. Oh yeah, I, I was just noticed the other day, um, something about the uh, Haxie Hood game in Lincolnshire. Um, and uh, they have a fool. The story is um, that a woman's hat, cat blew away. And um, one man retrieved it and was rewarded. Another man didn't. And the man who retrieved it was described as acting like a lord. And the one who didn't retrieve it was described as acting like a fool. And the Haxie Hood game still has a fool who wears tattered clothing with multiple colours and, at least until recently, a blackened face. So again, this is the classic fool. Nothing to do with dancing at all. But this is the classic fool. Um, so this was taken up as one element of midwinter going on um, and conflated with their riotousness, their license and their disguise. Um, so from that point of view, masking and face blacking, they're part of the tradition um, and an, an excuse or a cover up for bad behavior. Um, and the use of black in costume, not necessarily black costumes, but the use of black in the costume uh, and disguise to symbolize, symbolize and override respectability. And I finish with the word, but, because for all these assertions I make, you'll be able to come up with uh, contrary examples. And uh, that's just the way it goes. So I'm going to unshare my screen if I can. Um, go back. I'm going to look and see if I can get the uh, chat up. And if you have any questions, please do put them into the chat or else raise your hand and Pauline will uh, organize things from that point of view. I'll answer any questions you might have. And thank you very much for turning out on Sunday afternoon to do this. Now that there's so many better things to do. Thank you, Andrew. Well, we'll have some applause at the end. Have you found the chat? Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything in there? No. No. Okay, same as just Right, so we've got Sue Allen first up with her hand up. Over to you. Thanks, Pauline. Hi, Andrew. Hi. That was really good. Thank you very much. I was obviously very interested because my current research is around the upshot and the merry neat. And if that links possibly with the sword dancers at the Pantheon uh, some 20 years before that uh, in London, because Lonsdale may be linked with that because he yeah. was a theatre manager at Sadler's Wells at the time. Um, but stepping that aside, what I just wanted to say was all the riotousness and all the young men and all this. Um, I was just yesterday looking at, um, you must know the book, Ronald Hutton's Stations of the Sun, because uh, he, uh, Professor Hutton is fantastic. But one of the things he suggests, and I, I wonder what you think about this at the end, is that post the Reformation, um, well, prior to modern times, pre-modern times, there was no such thing as youth culture, but there was a lot of obviously enthusiasm and adolescence wanting to do stuff. And in a way, this was the way the community legitimized, and it would be young men because young girls had more restrictions around them, to do their riotous behavior. And all these things always happened um, you know, in the period between All Souls and Shrovetide, because that was the quieter time in the agricultural year. And mm. so they had time and space. And what do you think about that? It, it's, oh. it's the legitimization of youth culture. Oh, I agree, absolutely. Um, and I think that's very much what Carnival was about. Mm. Um, and um, at that time also, you had things like. Um, the boy bishops yeah, uh, exactly. yeah, and the idea that the, the world turned upside down and suddenly the people in charge happened to serve the youngsters and this kind of thing and um lords of misrule all this kind of thing yeah um I, I do think and as i say um there's the question of how do you keep these people on some kind of a leash and a structured organization like a guild 
um, would have this thing they could do without going too far. Whereas carnival, um, things could go too far uh, and did sometimes. So uh, yeah, I think absolutely that, that's right. Hence the masking, of course, yeah, as you rightly said, you needed to be disguised. And there's lots of other rough music and riding the stang and other writers' behaviour at Christmas. But yeah. I'm not seeing the black and masquerades in London, unlike their Venetian counterparts in the late 18th century, people were not wearing black. They were dressing as milkmaids and Morris dancers and ballad sellers and all sorts. There's something else here which... I haven't gone far enough into yet, you know, but I had a thought of it as a talk, was um, the, the Catholic nature of sword dancing. And uh, it really flourished in Catholic Europe and it got suppressed um, after the Reformation. And what we see in English sword dancing, particularly a lot of the English traditions, that, that it, it's some sort of post-Reformation settlement which allowed these things to continue, but in, in a rather different way. Um, so I think England, I know people hate going on, you know, there's this terrible phrase about British exceptionalism or English exceptionalism, but I think the, uh, the, in England, some sort of middle of the road was found, which um, in Catholic Europe, it, it, they found a slightly different way around it. And in Protestant Europe, very much they didn't. Uh, in, you know, the, the Calvinists certainly didn't like this kind of thing going on. Um, and but, Georgina, uh, Georgina Boyce has made those links in relation to the Nicholas Blundell, the early yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. play. Yeah. Yeah. Dance, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Great. So much to work on, isn't there? So much to yes. look at. Great. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Who's next? There must be some questions. We have sword dancers in the audience. <laughs> Here we go, Peter. Well, it's, this isn't really a question as such. It's a, uh, just a bit of information about Uberlingen. Um, you mentioned so, it's summer, but you didn't mention it was originally, I don't think you mentioned it was originally Shrovetide. Yeah. Got, okay. moved, got, got moved to the wine festival at yeah. summer. Yeah. If, if you go there, if you go to Uberlingen now, on the Saturday, Saturday evening of the Shrove weekend, yeah. um, there are a thousand registered Hanslers yeah. parade down the streets, yeah. which is really rather impressive. Yeah. And that's that's only the, the registered ones. There's obviously the children's ones and there's the unregistered ones. Um, and you mentioned about it... Uh, supposed to be men um the women got fed up there so there's now a another set who dress in red <laughs> who come down behind them which is all the women yeah. um but in a lot of the traditions around that area um they can be men or women in the character within a character but once they're in costume they act either as a man or a woman depending what the character is meant to be not what they are which yeah. is quite a mute. If you go to Elzac, which isn't that far from Uberling, and, um, and there's definitely women there, but they are being very raucous uh, as men. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, um, I, uh, I think almost always um, it, it was less, less clearly demarcated than um, the idea might suggest. I think, as I say, in, in Elgin, there, there was this woman, and she wasn't the only one. W women were being prosecuted just as much as the men were for things like guising and uh, that that kind of thing. Um, but uh, certainly, the sword dancing seems to have been. Um, uh, I haven't seen these signs of women slipping into the sword dancing, so to speak. Yeah. Interesting. Any more? Yeah, uh, Emma. It might be Jameson. Got their hand up. There's Jameson. Hello there. Hello. Thank you, Andrew. Nice to hear from you again. Um, I was just wondering, although you're sp talking specifically about sword dancing today, how far your ideas might be extrapolated to Morris dancing in general? Well, the thing is, looking through these things, 
I've seen just seen very little mention about Morris dancing uh, in that sense. Um, and well, it all depends which Morris dancing you're talking about as well, doesn't it? Um, but it does seem to be more of a summer pursuit, uh, a lot of the Morris, but then you've got things like the border, um, uh, you know, which again is, is a road I didn't really want to go down. So uh, that, um, the answer is I don't know. Again, the Morris seems to have a very English aspect of this, and I've been looking more at continental stuff. I found one mention of Morris dancers in the 18th century in Lunenburg, um, and it's not clear whether they were German Morris dancers or whether they were English visitors. Um, so I'm not really in a position to say. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Oh, no. Mike. Mike Heaney, please. Oh, lower hand. I'm mute. Um, yeah, just following on from Jameson's point, um, I think the, the only areas that I see that there are connections or parallels or whatever you like to call them, it's things like the face blacking of the supernumerary characters. Um, yeah. Costume of the supernumerary characters. And going back, Andrew, to your picture, I think it was the Zurich one, um, where they were face blacked and there were these food and so on. Of all the images you showed, that was the one that struck me as having most characteristics in common with the European Morris dance of the 15th and 16th centuries. Yeah. Um, it, it, including the, the position of the bells around the legs and so yeah. on. Like Israel van Mechenem's print and Erasmus Crassus' um, statues. So that one I thought, and, and of course, in the European tradition, there is a greater link between Morris and Sword. Um, things like, um, well, well, you get more references that, that do link them. So that, that struck me as being a, a, the Zurich picture, being an interesting halfway house between the yes. two. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I suppose it goes back to this question of what you think they were doing or what they thought they were doing rather. And um, I take Peter's point about um, the uh, Uberling and dance being a, a show of like, you know, um, Shrove Tuesday dance. But essentially, I think that the midwinter stuff, the Uberling stuff, well, I still would put on the respectable side. And the midwinter stuff, the, uh, the, the raucous stuff, um, I, I think um, the fact they did a, a, a sword dance was in some ways, what, what can we do? You know, what, while we're out dancing and singing all the rest of it, let's do a sword dance. Um, I, I don't think the sword dance was the purpose of the thing. Um, so it, to that extent, I would connect it less with the Morris. Although I know um, one or two of the um, border dances could be you know, just very spontaneous. Um, and um, again, we've, we've got certain recorded ones that uh, we, we tend to value the way it was recorded. Um, but I do know of ones where um, it was just some blokes would get up in the pub and do a few steps. Um, so possibly we should be making more of a distinction between Border Morris and some of the other traditions than we do. I don't know. Okay, back to, back to Sue Allen. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> me again, really sorry, oh. Anne. Uh, a question I want to ask because I need to, this information and to sort this out. You stated in your conclusions, yes, yeah, sword dance started in the towns with the guilds, etc., and then moved out. Where? What's the actual evidence, please? Um, oh, well, I've been going by a couple of, again, I'm, I'm talking about Germany rather than Britain. Um, yeah. I'm going by... Um, there's a lot from a chap called Meshka, who I've quoted, and um, another one, uh, Richard Wolfram. And they've done, um, they did huge, uh, they just did huge trawls. And you can look through, in, Meshka in particular provides you with a list of sources and dates. Um, and uh, there are so many in there, I haven't plotted them all, but the earlier ones um, are associated with borough life. And when you read about people dancing in the countryside, that tends to be more, more recent. That's a broad generalization. Meshka, I'd say, too. Okay. Um, 
unfortunately, as we all know, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence. Of yes. And there, the countryside ones would have been less well recorded at an earlier date. Yeah. So, yeah, it's still problematic, isn't it? Yeah, I will look out those references. That's really useful. Thank you. Thank you. It would have been, uh, sorry, it would have been less well recorded unless it was regarded as causing people trouble. Uh, and the, the moment it became troublesome, it would have been recorded. That's right, like ballad singers as well. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to share screen again, if I, oh, yeah, um, because I've got the list here. Um, how do I share screen? There we go. Um, let's just do that. Um, Sorry, this is taking longer than it should do. Um, okay, oh, wait. have I shared screen now? It says OneDrive isn't signed in, isn't oh, signed. I've shared the wrong thing then, okay. Um, right, we'll, we'll forget that, but um, I know Pauline will be circulating um uh the the slides afterwards so um or we can make the slides available so um uh my list of sources is on there so it tells okay. you to find meshka and so on great that's fantastic thanks okay okay any more for any more oh, they've all gone quiet andrew oh no here we go Paul McNamara. Yeah. He's being a bit ghostly. Uh, Paul, you need to uh, unmute. Hello. 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 It's a bit dark in here. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, hey. Okay. Uh, uh, what? Do you, do you have any idea of what tunes that would have been danced to? I noticed in the pictures there was uh, somebody uh, playing uh, some wind instrument and a, and a drummer. Would be interesting to say about yeah. what tunes would have downed. Um, yeah, we see fifes and drums regularly being used. Um, on the other hand, um, if you look at George Emerson, did a huge um, thing about um, traditional dancing, music and dance in Scotland. And he reckons that uh, for out of doors uh, in Scotland, it would have been the bagpipes uh, of some okay. kind. Um, so it's got to be something loud, hasn't it? Um, mm. In doors, Emerson reckoned uh, you'd, you'd be playing the fiddle, quite possibly. But for out of doors, you know, fifes and drums, fifes cut through and you, you can hear them a long way off. Um, bagpipes, likewise, can be quite loud if you choose the right ones um we don't really know um the, the particular tunes in particular we don't know no. okay okay all right thank you thank you any, any more duncan gone hi um while you're on the phone so to speak can I ask about a, a summer sword dance? Go on. Um, particularly the, the 1712 one in Blundell's Diary, where yeah. the eight sword dancers at the Marl Pit. Yeah. Dancing at the Marl Pit. Was that, was that quite common to, for people to dance at Marl Pit celebrations and stuff like that? The, the, this is a, a one-off, basically. The, there seems to is have it? been a tradition in the Blundell family of dancing because... Um, there was a previous Blundell, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's um, a sword dance song um, from about 1638. Um, but beyond that, we, we know very little. I, I've looked a little bit. I've been through Blundell's diaries and things. Mm -hmm. um, and they dance at the Marl Pit. And then they danced again um, a few weeks. It's a while since I've looked. A few weeks or months later, they danced at another event. And he mm -hmm. talks about my sword dance, 
Yeah. So I think it was not specifically about the mild thing. It's that we're going to have a party. Let's get a sword dance going. And he managed mm. to teach the dancers essentially in one practice. Um, so it can't have been a very complex thing. These were farm labourers and he taught them the sword mm. dance and they went out and did it. But he never talks about it. After this little period of, of a few months, he never really talks about it again. So I don't think, it, again, it wasn't central. It was just an idea. And the thing about Blundell was that he'd been educated, being a Catholic, he'd been educated um, over in the Low Countries um, because um, there was no Catholic education in Britain at that time. So he'd spent a good chunk of his life as a young man um, over in the Low Countries. So there's every chance, but we don't know, this is speculation. There's every chance he would have come across sword dancing there. Mm. Um, it just and the, sticks uh, out being from the Liverpool area, you know, which is sort of, yeah, as well. It seems, yeah, it is just a one off, you think. Um, as far as we know, yes. But yeah, as yeah. I say, there was a tradition in his family. Sword dancing was known to his family. Okay. okay. But mild pits, not specifically. <laughs> Cheers. What? Uh, me again. I was asking yeah. about the, the mile pit because that, that interested me because there's there was loads of mile pits around Cheshire where I live, which is where right. you know all, all the little ponds are that you, you see on the map are just the results of uh, of digging the yeah. mile out, yeah. So but yeah. just a one off. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Duncan. Anybody else? Any more questions? Oh, just on, sorry, just on the thought of Duncan's comment. Yeah. Um, there is, oh, now then, there's a play from that period from the early 18th century. Um, it's gone out of my head. I wasn't looking at it for today, um, where they talk about um, the noise of the Lancashire bagpipes. And I was trying to make an association. We know that um, Blundell employed a piper and a fiddler. And there seems to have been a particular thing called, uh, known as the Lancashire bag bagpipes. Um, mm. It's on the question of music. That's all. Just a snippet. Okay. Any more? So. <laughs> Go on. Oh, hold on. Just I put it in chat because I didn't want to speak again, but nobody's looking. Um, what about intersection between sword dances as performed at whether a civic or in the countryside at other celebrations with theatre versions, theatre dances? Have you um, that intersection? Yeah, that, that's something I've not looked at at all. Um, I mean, th there will have been times when it ended up on, on, on the stage because there was the group that went from um, um, Cumberland down to London, wasn't there? um later on in the 18th century um and i think they would have been dancing in theater but more than that i, I don't know I, I haven't seen the mention of that um with the the european stuff i've looked at there's lots of references to sword dances that were done just as an individual dance but i haven't yet found any newspaper reports of a linked sword dance as yet um but it, it means trawling Lots of old newspapers, basically. Yes. Play bills. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I, I haven't been down that road. Right. I'm trying to go down some of it. I'll keep in touch. Yeah, good. Any more? No, I think you may have exhausted them, Andrew. Okay, that, that's that's great. <laughs> well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Massive thanks to Andrew. And if anyone, everyone can please unmute themselves and uh, give Andrew a round of applause. Thank you.